So Michael asked, how many positions would you recommend? What size is too low? Do you think that it's smart to have a starter position to learn about a position? Um, and I'll, I'll add a question on top of that. Do you have a number that's like, okay, this is just too concentrated. I've got to trim. Great questions. Uh, they're all great questions. And a lot of them have, I, I almost think they were, they were answered in the question. So I think, uh, I think a 10% allocation is a pretty good ballpark, um, solid position. And I think it's okay to step into that position. So maybe a two, five to 10. I tend to treat, uh, I do think it's okay to have a starter position. I think it's helpful. So I tend to sort of have a small basket of a few small positions. And then some of them don't ever go from, and when I say starter, I sort of mean 2%. So you make a 2% holding and maybe you watch it for a while and you realize you didn't see everything, but when it's in your portfolio, you'll, you'll care about it a lot more. So, uh, and so I think it's okay to do a 2% position and, um, and have a small basket of those two percenters. And then maybe you make one of them big and you eliminate another one. Um, I think, uh, it's, it's hard for most people to imagine this, Jonathan, but I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is selling too early or selling at all. Okay. So I really want to own, I call them our infinite compounders. I want to own businesses that I never have to even think about selling. So uh, daily journal, we were just talking about, that's one of these holdings. Uh, and I'll just, it, it's so interesting how much noise I can ignore. There's, there is almost nothing. I get information, inflow of information from people all the time. They're trying to be helpful. They tell me why daily journals going to zero. They tell me why some contract just failed. They tell me, you know, Charlie Munger's about to, Charlie Munger's, you know, they, they've already got the, uh, the writings on the wall. Charlie Munger's not going to live for another 30 years. Say, so, oh yeah, okay, thanks. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of scary short-term uh, events that could happen to every firm, even really strong firms, like a daily journal or a Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, but we have no intention of selling. This looks like a, you know, 2 billion maybe firm in the short, not in the medium term, and it will just still continue growing. So, uh, so the hardest thing to do, Jonathan, is when a firm that was a 10% holding becomes a 30 or 40 or 50% holding, you're really supposed to keep holding it. I mean, you don't want to, I think Buffett says you don't want to cut your flowers and water the weeds. If you've got one position growing faster than everything else in your portfolio, and then you start chopping that off and then adding to the other ones, you know, it's the, it's the exact opposite of, of uh, what you should do. So if you have an infinite compounder, great business model, reasonable price, and, you know, a, a great management team, business is growing and uh and it's one of like a few unique positions that you own i you just you're you're supposed to let that let that continue its compounding just don't interrupt the compounding so would you let's say that i don't know you got it let's let's say you got some crazy company and it just took off and it became 75 percent of your funds <laughs> Assets, would you just let it ride? It's a really difficult question. We're not in that situation. But it's sort of, it, it depends on a lot of factors, like what business it is. Uh, and if the business itself is diversified and safe. So, um, I will tell you that if we were to trim, what we would likely be doing is we would be selling out of the money calls on that position that go out for a little while. And, and if something had run up to that 
level, those call premiums would be enormous. So it, you know, it would be like the portfolio stayed flat or the world collapsed. And then one position went from $20 a share to $200 a share. We can now sell a $250 strike for $50. So that hedges us a little bit. If it declines, we still keep the premium from the call. And if it runs up another 25%, maybe we exit a little bit. 75% um, is a really big number. I think for my own personal portfolio, I would let that continue. Uh, I wouldn't, I would, if, but it's, That's it's, impressive. More, a little, <laughs> it's a little more difficult. Most of my money's in the fund anyway, but it's a little more difficult when it's in a fund, fund structure because you have partners that would be uncomfortable. And you have so much volatility, it would, even the ones that weren't uncomfortable would become uncomfortable. So uh, look, maybe we've had 40% holdings before and I don't trim those, but maybe if it's going over 50% uh, in a fund, uh, you know, you're overstepping Kelly at that point. We talked about the Kelly criterion and how like somewhere between two and 10 positions were, um, were like ideal holdings. So if suddenly you have fewer than two, uh, maybe you can trim a little bit. That might be how I think about it. We're not, we don't have that problem, but I think our largest position right now is probably 18% or so. But, um, but the, anyway, that's a great question. I think people sell generally too early. You gotta, let, you gotta let those compounders run. You really just, if you just step back and you, do, you get out of the way you're compounding, you'll be fine. And, and um, I think it was Fidelity that did an, an experiment or did a study yeah, I, I want, I'm not, I can't remember if it was Fidelity, but there was a study by a major brokerage house. And what they did is they broke all of their client accounts. They had a huge number of client accounts. They broke them into, into basically deciles in terms of performance over long periods of time. They said, if we could learn what people are doing to outperform everybody else, maybe we could help all of our clients. What they discovered was that uh, the top decile was made up with the folks who had either forgotten that they had an account with Fidelity or were deceased. So uh, it was actually kind of made it difficult for them to, to suggest that to everybody. But um, the idea is, you know, presumably some of these accounts ended up with a really big compounder and probably became very overweight once security, you still leave it alone and you end up outperforming. Good stuff. Look at, look at NASPERS, look at NASPERS. NASPERS is a VC firm. They made one investment. They did very little trimming. It became the whole business. It, it, and it's breaking the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I, I guess like when, when I look at that stuff like that personally, my, my biggest concern is like the potential for survivorship bias. Um, you know, but, uh, but it's interesting reading, like you, you mentioned Hunter Baggers earlier. He talks about, I think I read an article by the author and he talked about like this uh, this guy that, that his firm was advising this woman and his his her, her husband basically copied all their investments like without you know actually applying to the firm but the thing that he did differently was he just bought the stock and then never sold it whereas you know the firm yep. the wife who they were managing like they kept rebalancing it and his account was like five times more valuable than hers so yeah I think I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that professional managers make you you spend so much time doing uh, study on, on buying a business uh, and you really, you know, if the buying's done right, the time to sell is almost never. So you're getting the best business model in the world. You're getting the best management teams in the world. There's a lot of things that could hit that business negatively and you would still have a management team that'll steer that ship in the right direction. So you might personally not even know what's going to happen, but if you've really made a, a proper investment in a great business with great management teams and you paid a reasonable price, you can let that run. And, um, and I mean, the time to sell is really almost never. And you can see examples, Munger just talked about this again, and it was about, uh, he talked about the, the uh, Berkshire Hathaway position World Book Encyclopedia. They still own World Book Encyclopedia. They had Microsoft giving away free electronic encyclopedias. 
I'm sure there's very, very low cash flow coming from World Book Encyclopedia, but they have still never sold that business. And it's, uh, and it's just sort of a testament to how people should act.